נמצא איתנו היום אדם מדהים, ג'ף דאובה, שהוא נאבק על דוח אדמונד לוי שאומר שאנחנו נמצאים בארץ שלנו והיא שלנו. who is exactly doing that, fighting to show that this is our land for the Edmund Levy report, that we are not occupiers, and continue. And now he's going to show us how. First of all, Boca Tov, everybody. Uh, before, before we get started, uh, uh, there are a number of thank yous that are in order. Uh, uh, but uh, in any case, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank everybody for coming out this morning. Uh, I know the weather lately has been pretty miserable, uh, so thank you all for coming. And I'd like to first and foremost uh, thank uh, Nadia and Yudit. I always say that uh, when I grow up, I want to be just like Nadia and Yudit. <laughs> And uh, I would also like to thank uh, Karen, uh, Karen Stoldan, uh, not only a very, very close friend from uh, Riverdale Tree Alia, uh, but also uh, one of those who works, as we say, behind the scenes, uh, her uh, thesis, uh, her law school thesis, has become like my Tanakh, and uh, you all should read it. Uh, I will be glad to get it to you. Uh, it is an incredible treatise on exactly why it is uh, that we have legal rights where we are standing and sitting now. Uh, so I highly recommend it. Thank you, Karen, for everything that you've done. And I would also like to thank uh, In Absentia my legal grants co-chair, Arlene Kushner, uh, who is also uh, somebody who uh, operates behind the scenes while I'm running around in the Knesset, while I'm running around in Washington. Arlene is there uh, taking care of the nitty-gritty, the scut work, as we say, and Achrona, uh, Achrona Chaviva, uh, I would also like to thank my Eshet Chayel uh, in absentia. Uh, she unfortunately at this moment is in Galut. Uh, she is in New York and uh, she would have been out here because she is also what I call my Cinderella. Uh, she, again, while I'm running around uh, like a nudnik uh, all over the place uh, advocating for things like uh, our place, our sovereignty on Harazetim, uh, while I'm arguing for our legal rights, uh, she is the one who is taking care of the important matters, getting the literature ready, uh, making the appropriate phone calls, uh, doing all the stuff uh, that needs to get done uh, in order for those in the forefront uh, to do our job. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me just talk uh, uh, briefly about what we're going to be talking about today. What I would like to do is, what I would like to do is I would like to uh, spend as little time as possible actually lecturing and open up the conversation uh, to questions and answers as soon as possible. Uh, I have found that when I have done these presentations, uh, the suggestions, the criticisms uh, that you have offered have sometimes helped me in this campaign. So I would like to leave as much uh, time as possible for that. Uh, just let me take care of a couple of uh, housekeeping issues uh, before uh, we get started. Uh, first of all, uh, these devices over here, uh, if you can either uh, shut them down or put them on mute. Uh, beepers, any other electronic devices, I always say that uh, 
pacemakers are optional. Uh, uh, all other all other devices, uh, please please uh, put them on mute. And the other thing that I would like to uh, just uh, take care of right now is uh, oops. If anybody uh, would like uh, any of the handouts, uh, I'm doing something a little different because Nadia couldn't say uh, exactly how many people we were going to have out here, so I didn't know exactly how much to uh, photocopy. Uh, so what I did was this. Uh, if we have a pen and could pass this uh, uh, loose leaf, this binder around, in here I have an email sign-up sheet and on the uh, right hand side of the sheet it uh, says virtual handouts I have in each of these sleeves right over here numbered handouts all you do is just put down your name clearly your email clearly and which numbered handouts you want uh, and then I will make it my business over the course of the next few days to get those uh, emails out to you and to send it to you as an email. Uh, I taught environmental studies for decades before and uh, we have an opportunity here also to <coughs> save some of the trees around us. Uh, so just let me uh, tell you briefly uh, what's in here. Uh, number one, I have a legal grounds interim report. Uh, you could pull it out of the sleeve, take a look at it. Uh, the one that I have in here is from April 2016. I have a legal grounds uh, update. Uh, that's from October uh, 2016. I'll send that to you. I have legal grounds summaries. I have uh, legal grounds uh, fact sheets. Uh, these are cheat sheets uh, that we use. If you need, uh, let's say, bulleted points, uh, then I, I would strongly urge you to use those uh, cheat sheets uh, tells us what the myths are as opposed to what the facts are. I have some of our lobbying material that we use in the Knesset in Hebrew. This is in Hebrew. Uh, for those... Jeff, Jeff, can I suggest that anybody who wants everything, everything, just, just write your email and you'll send everything I'll send everything. If you want everything, if you want everything... You want everything you not going to start deciding which Not using any trees to... Uh, uh, yeah, sure. So I'll just pass this around. I also have... Uh, so just let me tell you quickly what's in here. I also have uh, uh, letters from Bezalel Smotrich that I have used in Congress. Uh, he is a big, big supporter of ours. I have something called, also in Hebrew, as it was called Haflatat Chamishim Shlaim Chamishim Ve'achad. Resolution 5251, which you'll find interesting. I'll show you on the PowerPoint. And I also included some of my lobbying material that I use in Washington uh, for legal grounds. So I'm just going to pass this around. If we have a pen, also what I'm going to pass around, uh, can you give me that, that book drawer? Uh, we have a Knesset strategist that we engage. His name is Don Iluz. He's incredible. Uh, he also works with us in social media. And uh, he wrote a book uh, just now. It uh, was just published. It's called The Free Nation in Our Land. Uh, I think everybody sitting here would really uh, love this book. This is a signed copy, so I, I would really like it back. Uh, but if you would like uh, a copy of the book, I can get you ordering information. I'll pass this around also uh, so that you can take a look at it. Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, number one, uh, why did I get involved in this campaign called Legal Grounds? I am the director of the Israel Office for the Zionist Organization of America, the ZOA. Uh, I often say uh, ZOA, ZOA, uh, the A in ZOA stands for the Tsari Harav, not Aliyah. It stands for America. I wish it did stand for Aliyah, but it doesn't. Uh, we're going to talk about what the LG campaign or what the Legal Grounds campaign is exactly. Uh, we're going to talk about the rationales. Why is it that we need a Legal Grounds campaign? 
Uh, also, uh, some of our activities, some of the progress that we've uh, been making, uh, future challenges, future activities, and finally, finally, uh, in this case, Akharon, Akharon, Ulai, Akhi exactly what you can do in order to help us. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the uh, slogan uh, that uh, President Trump, President-elect Trump used in his campaign, uh, Make America Great Again. Uh, the slogan uh, that I think that we should adro adopt here is uh, Make or Making Greater Israel Great Again. It's been 2,000 years uh, since Greater Israel has been great again, and it's about time that we get started. I, the Legal Grounds Campaign, and I'll talk about exactly what the Legal Grounds Campaign is, uh, is uh, all about uh, getting our leadership to speak out, and to speak out vocally, and to speak out strongly about our and you see BB here, this is our signature car cartoon. Uh, we use cartoons, we use anything, video, whatever it takes to get the message out. You see BB is holding uh, legal grounds, uh, our legal rights behind, and uh, he's whispering in uh, Obama's ear about our legal rights. The idea is not to whisper. The idea is to shout at the top of your lungs. When I took this position, when I made Aliyah nine years ago, and my boss, Mark Klein, uh, said, Jeff, your mandate is to get Israeli leadership to speak out strongly, clearly, resolutely about our rights. And this is what this campaign is all about. I am just following uh, the mandate of my boss. Why? Uh, David Jacobs asked me uh, just before, you know, from which angle are we hitting this? Are, are we hitting BB? Are we hitting the leadership here? Are we hitting, uh, is this a campaign for, uh, let's say, the leadership in the United States? And my answer to David was, it is actually both. Uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to hit the entire issue of the levy report, I should say the Muscanote, the conclusions of the levy report, uh, from both angles, from a U.S. angle and from an Israeli angle. But first and foremost, the most important thing is to get our leadership here to speak out about it, and I will tell you why in a second. But before I do, let's take a look. You just saw BB on the uh, previous cartoon. Look at this quote from June of 2014. The only way you defeat a lie is with the truth, with facts, with courage. The truth has to be told about the Jewish people and the Jewish state first by the Jews. First by the Jews. First, second, and third by the Jews, by us here. And why do I say that? Uh, what exactly is TGLB? It's not LGBT, it's not a sexual liberation movement on campus. Uh, TGLB stands for the Trans Green Line Boycott. Trans Green Line Boycott. That means when I go down to Washington, and I go down to Washington uh, twice a year, spend about 11 months here, let me just correct one little thing that you uh, put out on the, uh, let's say, on the uh, public relations material. I don't split my time between uh, Washington and Israel. I spend about 11 months of my time here. I go over to the U.S. twice uh, for about two, two and a half weeks each time, and I spend the better part of a week uh, down in Washington. I just mentioned David Jacobs, what I have started doing. Uh, his daughter, Mehira, went down with me for a few days this uh, past trip, what I have started doing, uh, because uh, we have got to get young people into the political uh, culture. 
uh, they have got to start understanding the political topography both here and in the United States. So when I go to the Knesset, when I go to the Misrata Chutz here, when I go to the State Department, Department of Justice or Congress in the United States, I have started to take young people along with me. Okay, it's very, very important uh, that we get uh, young people involved in the process. And uh, when I go down there, and this is pre-Doch Edmund Levy, before the Levy report was even issued on July 8, 2012, I argued with members of Congress that we should break this trans-green line boycott. What is it exactly? Roughly between 250 and 400 million dollars goes uh, from U.S. aid, U.S. Agency for International Development and the Middle East Partnership Initiative uh, to the Palestinian Arabs in what they call the West Bank, what I call Judea Samaria. Okay. $400 million per year in aid. There are roughly seven, eight, whatever, nine percent of the population that lives here. It's the Jewish uh, population, depending on whether you believe the uh, Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics uh, data. But uh, what we argue is that at least that proportion should go to Jewish communities here, to Jewish institutions here. And let me give you one quick example. Pre Doch Edmond Levy, uh, we put together U.S. Jerusalem consulate officials, U.S. embassy officials in the conference room of Ariel University. Okay, in quote unquote occupied territory. And uh, on one side of me at this big, big conference table was sitting Dr. Kobe Anker, an agron agronomist, hydrologist from Ariel University and also Tel Aviv University at the time. On the other side of me was sitting Dr. Jawad Hassan, okay, also a hydrologist, agronomist from Al-Quds University. Ariel, the city of Ariel, if you take away the roughly 14, 14,500 students at Ariel University, you have about roughly 19, 20,000 people living in Ariel remaining. The sister town of uh, Ariel, uh, the Arab town that is literally on the next hillside, is a town called Salfit. Okay, Salfit has roughly the same number of people. Ariel has a very, very sophisticated water sewage treatment facility. Very sophisticated. Uh, they recycle, uh, I think, upwards of 80 to 90 percent of their gray water. Uh, it's just incredible. Salfit. When I, I mentioned that I used to teach environmental studies, Salfit has something that we euphemistically in environmental studies call TIPS, T-I-P-S. T-I-P-S stands for Traditional Indigenous Pastoral Solutions. That means that you have an open view and the raw sewage spills out of this raw sewage spills out of this view it rolls down the hillside down into the body down below under the body down below there is an underground stream called Nahal Shiloh the particulates the pollution then uh, percolates down into the groundwater and it goes down to the coastal aquifer in pre-1967 Israel, okay? Water pollution, air pollution knows nothing about green lines. So what, what, what were we arguing for here? What kind of a case were we making with the State Department officials? We were asking for, excuse the pun, a drop in the bucket of R&D, research and development funding for Ariel University to take the non-existent 
water sewage treatment facility in Salfit and hook it up to the sophisticated water sewage treatment facility in Ariel. A win, win, win. The Arabs win, the Israelis win, and the environment wins. Dr. Jawad Hassan and Dr. Kobe Anker were having an animated conversation right across me. Uh, they were just uh, uh, very excited about the possibility uh, that they could work together on this Dukium project. How much did we get? Zero. Let me translate. FS. Okay. We got nothing. Uh, so, what I've been trying to do, uh, and I have like the figurative black and blue marks on my head from banging my head against the wall uh, down in Washington, but uh, what we've been trying to do is we have been trying to break TGLB. What happens when I go to members of Congress uh, after having visited the State Department is they tell me on my way out, uh, they may be holding me, let's say, by the elbow as they're, uh, we're walking out of the office together and they say, Listen, Jeff, we are not 100% behind you, we are 200% behind you, but... We cannot be more Catholic than the Pope. We can't be more Zionist than the leadership in Israel. You go back to Israel, you get your guys in Israel to speak up about this, and then we will pick up the baton and we will press the State Department. And you will see in one of those packets that I sent around to you, you will see within my lobbying material two letters, one from a congressman with, that I'm very close with, his name is Doug Lamborn, to the State Department requesting why is it that there is a discriminatory policy? Why is it that there is a de facto boycott of a group of people based on their religious or or national persuasion. Okay, another letter in there from Senator Pat Toomey, also close with uh, Senator Toomey. Same thing, asking the State Department why there is a discriminatory policy. What we have got to do is we have got to get our leadership here to speak out about our legal rights. Once we do that, once we get them to speak out, uh, the members of Congress will fall in line. Now, why legal grounds? Okay, this is why legal grounds. Okay, because I do not want any more among us. Okay, okay, Daikba. Okay, really, enough already. Uh, what we have got to do is we have got to drill down. We have got to take a look at this report. Uh, there are some problems with the report, which is why we changed our name uh, from uh, the campaign to promote the levy report to the campaign to promote uh, Israel's legal rights. By the way, based on international law, uh, not based on, on Jewish law. This is a campaign based on international law. Uh, why? Because uh, Years ago, you may recognize this, uh, the women in green here, Nadia, Yudit, were at uh, Beit HaShalom. I decided many, many years back uh, to establish a temporary, it turned out to be a very temporary, uh, ZOA branch office in Beit HaShalom in Hebron. Does everybody here know? I know I'm talking to a very educated uh, crowd here. Everybody knows uh, the whole saga of Beit HaShalom. We figured by putting down, let's say, an American organizational presence there, we could at the very, very least make a very, very powerful statement. Uh, I was sitting uh, one day when I was supposed to go out to Beit HaShalom in order to hang a plaque on the wall with David Wilder, uh, who was the spokesperson for the Jewish community of Hebron at the time, sitting in Tal Bagels in Emek uh, Rafahim uh, in Yerushalayim with some fellow Ephratians, uh, uh, Peter and Avi Abelo, and I get a call from David. He said, Jeff, don't bother coming out this afternoon. We're not going to be hanging any plaque uh, because Barak uh, ordered and implemented the uh, Pinoy, the, the evacuation of uh, Beit HaShalom. Uh, Beit HaShalom, by the way, we've returned to Beit HaShalom, but it took many, many years. Did the same thing down below. Do you see, you know what Al-Majrun is? 
<laughs> Has anybody here ever heard of Al Madrun? No. It's actually Migron. Okay. Uh, do you know uh, we destroy Jewish houses, but we don't really do very much about all of the illegal Arab building. And for those of you who know uh, what I'm involved in, you know that one of the things that I'm involved in is Har Hazetim. Har Hazetim. One of the reasons why I'm involved in it, not only to advocate for the 150,000 Jews that are buried there, uh, but one of the other reasons that I'm uh, very, very concerned about is because there is something in uh, Yerushalayim that we call the Jerusalem Gaza Strip. There is an almost, almost uninterrupted uh, strip of illegal Arab building from the north, from Ramallah El Bira, all the way down to Beit Lechem. Anybody want to take a guess? Approximately, plus minus. Uh, how many? How many uh, illegal Arab structures are there? Twenty thousand. Ten thousand. Try about 38,000. 38,000. 38,000 illegal Arab structures. I was uh, going through Silwan with uh, Mayor Nir Barkat. Uh, there are about 600 structures in uh, Silwan. Uh, approximately six, six, one percent are legal. Okay. Uh, so none of that, or very, very little of that actually gets demolished. There can be a tzav miniyah on the building, a, a, a per, work prevention order, uh, or a tzav harissa on buildings that have already gone up. Very, very few of them are executed. So we figured what we would do when I opened up another ZOA branch office in Migron was we would rename the community instead of Migron, Al Madrun. Maybe we wouldn't get destroyed. <laughs> Okay. Uh, that, that obviously didn't work. Uh, by the way, has anybody been up on the, the hilltop of Migron lately? Have you seen uh, the Arabs uh, from Burka who uh, were uh, the supposed owners? Have you seen them use the land? Have you seen them put up any structures there? No. No. There's nothing there. Uh, so, uh, which leads me to the, the picture up on the top. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Amono situation, this was also many, many years ago when I was up there uh, with somebody who teaches, who lives there. His name is Yehuda Baruchi. Uh, that's his daughter over there. She must be a young woman by this time. Uh, and we were standing there in front of the ruins of Amona. A uh, very, very painful situation, uh, but there's always hope. Uh, that that picture for me uh, means a lot because uh, uh, that young lady there uh, was waving the flag. Uh, for me, that means that we're going to return, and we're going to return to Amona. We're going to return to uh, where? Well, uh, we're going we're going to return to Migron. Uh, we're going to return to the Ulpana. Uh, we are going to return to all of these places uh, because Gush. Thank you. Uh, because, let's face it, it's ours, okay? I can't, I can't uh, make it any simpler than that. So, when we talk about uh, legal grounds, what are we talking about? Uh, what exactly are our rights and what are they based on? First and foremost, first and foremost, they are based on the 1922 mandate for Palestine. That is the last internationally recognized document uh, that establishes our, uh, let's say, sovereignty uh, and uh, Jewish national homeland. In addition, there's Article 80 of the 1945 UN Charter. Article 80 basically states, sometimes they call it the Zionist article, the Arabs call it the Zionist article, because what that says is that all previous mandates from the League of Nations, let's recall that there was a hiatus between 1939 and 1945, all previous mandates from the League of Nations continue in force with the establishment of the United Nations. 
Let's be very clear. The United Nations General Assembly Resolution 181 is not a legal document. It was a recommendation. The partition plan was not an internationally recognized legal document. The only resolution that uh, coming out of the United Nations would be recognized as an international document and that international legal document is something that comes out of the UN Security Council either chapter 6 or chapter 7 uh, resolution in the UN Security Council it was not an internationally legal uh, legally recognized document uh, in addition uh, we consider the Jordanian invasion of Judea and Samaria as illegal, therefore their annexation of Judea and Samaria was illegal. Indeed, it was not recognized by any country in the world, including the Arab countries, with the exception of Pakistan and Great Britain, and some will say Iraq. Uh, the British, uh, but the British, by the way, did not even recognize uh, Jordan's illegal annexation of uh, Jerusalem. Okay, uh, Israel's 1967 war was a defensive war. There were any number of what we call casus belli in international uh, law, any number of aggressive actions or belligerent actions that Jordan took, uh, that Syria took, that Egypt took, uh, which uh, made our response, despite the fact that it was preemptive, a defensive action, and therefore our presence in Judea and Samaria is legal. If Judea and Samaria were not controlled by a legal sovereign, and Jordan was not recognized as a legal sovereign, therefore the laws of occupation do not apply. Okay, we cannot call it a kibush. It is not a kibush. It is not an occupation, not based on my personal ideology. It is not an occupation based on international law. In fact, the Rhodes Agreement of 1949, which established not the borders, don't let anyone ever call them the June 4, 1967 borders. The lines that were established here were exactly that. They were lines. They were ceasefires. They were armistice lines. In fact, what Jordan and Egypt insisted on doing was putting into the Rhodes Agreement a stipulation that the future political borders will not be prejudiced, will not be prejudged, will not be determined by these ceasefire lines. They saw them also uh, as temporary. Therefore, Let's go to the uh, conclusions of the Levy Report, and this is what we loosely base our campaign on. Israel's presence in Judea, Samaria is what we call sui generis. It is unique. Now, here's part of the problem uh, with uh, what our campaign does as opposed to, let's say, uh, the what the Levy Report uh, stipulated. What we say is that it is comparable uh, to other so-called, if you want to call it, let's, let's say for a second you want to call it an occupation. Let's say you want to call this an occupation, okay? We prefer calling it disputed territories, but if, let's say uh, for argument's sake right now you want to call this an occupation. If you compare it to 
any of the other roughly 200, 200 disputed, uh, let's say, uh, land situations throughout the world, whether you're talking about Kashmir, which is disputed between uh, India and Pakistan, or uh, northern Cyprus, uh, disputed between the Cypriots and Turkey, that's, that's an occupation. You talk about Western Sahara, uh, which is an illegal, illegally occupied by Morocco, and I can go, the Kuril Islands, uh, I can go on and on and on if you compare it to that. The kind of negative attention that this area gets from the international community is by orders of magnitude greater than any other land dispute throughout the entire world. So one of our legal advisors, his name is Professor Eugene Kantorovich, uh, prefers not considering this uh, sui generis, not unique. Uh, what he claims is that it should be compared to other occupations, and therefore uh, we have an even stronger case than saying uh, that it is sui generis. Number two, Israel is not in violation of any laws of occupation. We just went through why that is the case. Number three, if we say that uh, Israel is not in violation of any of the laws of occupation, then, the, and I put this in quotes, the settlements are not illegal. I call them communities, okay? But uh, for the purpose of uh, the legal documents that we're dealing with, I, I, I put the settlements in quotes. Israelis had the right to live and to build in Judea and Samaria. And Article 49, Section 6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which talks about displaced peoples, what Article 49, uh, Section 6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention was actually talking about was uh, the situation with the Nazis during World War II, where they forcibly removed, let's say, Poles from certain areas and forcibly, coercively moved uh, Germans, native Germans, into those areas, or forcibly removed Czechs from uh, the areas of Sudetenland and forcibly uh, moved or transferred uh, German populations into those areas. That is what. Article 49, Section 6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention applies to what we do here in Judea and Samaria, to the best of my knowledge, anybody sitting here who lives in Efrat or any of the other communities around here uh, were not transferred here forcibly by the Israeli government. Uh, if you've been, uh, raise your hand, I'll, uh, I'll duly note it. Another very, very important principle in international law uh, that has been put forward by two of it, our advisors, again, Professor uh, Eugene Kantorovich and also Professor Avi Bell, is the principle of uh, uti posidetis juris. Okay, I call it UPJ uh, for short, for obvious reasons. And uh, what that basically states in just a few words is that the lines, or the borders, if you will, that existed pre-state for any state, and they could be borders of, let's say, a province, or borders of a non-state entity, uh, will be the borders of the state after it has gained sovereignty. So, for instance, let me give you an example. I, the entire Serbian area, Yugoslavia, was broken up. It was broken up into Macedonia. It was broken up into Bosnia-Herzegovina. It was broken up into Croatia. Uh, you take the former Soviet uh, republics, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, uh, Estonia, Kazakhstan, all of the Central Asian republics, what were the borders when they became the Ukraine? When they became uh, independent states, they were the borders of the republics when they were within the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. It's the principle of uti posidetus uh, juris, and uh, this is, if anybody wants to read it, it's a heavy reading from the uh, Arizona University, you know, State, Arizona State University Law Journal. Uh, 
Eugene Kondorovich and Avi Bell wrote a wonderful, wonderful uh, piece in that monograph, and it says, given the location of the borders of the Mandate of Palestine, applying the doctrine of uti posedetus juris to Israel would mean that Israel has territorial sovereignty over all the disputed areas of Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza, except to the degree that Israel has voluntary, voluntarily yielded sovereignty since its independence. In other words, uh, it's all ours, except if we decide to give up on it ourselves. Uh, what is uh, the legal grounds uh, action plan? What is it that we are trying to do exactly? Let me go through this quickly, uh, because again, I think we're we're running a little low on time, right? Another six minutes. Okay, uh, so I'm going to race through this. Uh, this campaign. This campaign. Even ten. Okay. Uh, this campaign uh, actually, thank God, has been growing. Uh, steadily. Uh, we've been conducting this campaign for about uh, two and a half going on three years now. And uh, first and foremost, uh, what we try to do is we try to educate members of Knesset. Uh, because members of Knesset are not going to be willing to speak out about this unless they feel comfortable with the material. The last thing that a member of Knesset or an official from the Misrata Chutz wants is to get caught out there. He's on an interview on uh, or whatever the case may be, and he does not want to be caught out there uh, lacking the information. So we try to get the information to them. Uh, we try to provide them with the platforms. They have conducted uh, Robert Ilitov and Ayala Chakid when uh, she was still uh, just a plain vanilla, Chavrat uh, Knesset, before she became Minister of Justice. Uh, uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> she's, uh, she's chocolate. Her. Okay, uh, exactly how we do it. Number one, we prepare materials for them. Uh, number two, uh, we make them aware of the situation. What we're trying to do is we're trying to sensitize them uh, to the situation that exists within the international community. Uh, I try to uh, educate them about my situation in Washington and how how, uh, let's say, their speaking out about these issues can be helpful to me. And uh, so, so that's uh, basically what we try to do is we try to meet with members of Knesset. We also try to provide them with the platforms. In other words, we will let them know that on our Facebook page, on their Facebook page, in newspapers, and uh, we have a PR specialist in newspapers, in uh, any medium that we can uh, deploy, we will push out their statements. In fact, what we are going to do, Nadia, is we are going to provide a space on our website uh, which will list uh, the members of Knesset and statements that they have made uh, that are favorable to legal grounds. You know, I spoke to a PR specialist once. Uh, he said, you go into Ramallah and you wake up Saeed Arakat at 3 o'clock in the morning and you ask him, what is he all about? What does he want? And in his groggy stupor, he will be able to tell you, uh, Aleph Bet Gimel, okay? One, two, three. Exactly what it is they want, okay? And you speak to, let's say, one of our representatives, the wise class, one of our negotiators. Uh, what is it exactly that Israel wants in this negotiation process? And they will say, uh, Mitzad Echad, I said, you know, I once made a speech, uh, it was actually in Hebrew at a community called Harisha because their uh, housing there was uh, being threatened at one time a long time ago. And I said, the one thing that we have to remove from our uh, lexicon, from our bilon, is the word me'idah. Okay? Uh, because 
uh, when we give these mixed, sometimes double messages, and unfortunately our Prime Minister is guilty of that, uh, he'll make a very strong statement, and then uh, two minutes later, uh, he will make a statement about uh, uh, the two-state, so-called two-state solution. Uh, my boss, by the way, my boss, Mark Klein, is vehemently opposed uh, to that terminology. Uh, we should never, ever, ever use that uh, terminology because two-state two state means that our state is contingent upon, is conditional upon the creation of another state. Excuse me. Our state and the sovereignty of our state is not contingent upon the creation of any other state. Uh, so uh, I think it's very, very unfortunate uh, that the Prime Minister made a statement about the pursuing this so-called two-state solution with the Trump administration coming in. He didn't have to outline any alternative. All he could have said was that we're looking forward to uh, having a conversation with the new administration about creative, innovative approaches to solving the Israeli-Palestinian Arab conflict. Very, very simple. Very diplomatic, very presidential, and or prime ministerial, and uh, he could have very, very easily uh, gotten away with uh, something like that. Uh, now, now the Trump administration or David Friedman, good news, good news, everybody. Yes, yes. David Friedman, U.S. ambassador, uh, good friend, very good friend of my boss, very, very good friend of ZOA. He'll be a very good friend of yours uh, if I can help it. So. Uh, uh, this is uh, something that actually uh, works counter to what David Friedman would like to do. You talk about you talk about moving uh, the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, which would help us assert our sovereignty in Jerusalem, and. Uh, we could have, I don't care, uh, Nadia Nuhudit uh, take a, um, let's say, a, let's say a full approach to the issue of Ribonot, uh, the issue of sovereignty. Uh, I take uh, another kind of approach. I try to help uh, members of Knesset understand that what we have got to do is we have got to uh, bring people around as an educator, and uh, I uh, dealt with very, very many uh, students, uh, dysfunctional adolescents, behavior disordered adolescents at a residential treatment center for 31 years. Uh, very, very often, uh, my students who are very, very intelligent would come to me at the, this residential treatment center and uh, they would have, let's say, a third grade math level. We're talking about 16, 17 year old, very, very bright uh, young people who uh, were out of school for long periods of time, they would come to me with a third grade math level. I would not take them uh, into, let's say, an 11th year trigonometry or calculus program. I would have to work with them from where they're at. The last slide in this presentation will show you why I'm taking more of an incrementalist approach. Uh, we have got to get the Israeli year used to this concept of our uh, legality, our legitimacy in this area based on international law. Uh, but why do I say this? We can either plop down the American Embassy right now in Jerusalem. There is space in uh, East Talpiot that the United States owns. They could put the embassy there. Or we can take an incrementalist approach. We can say that the U.S. Ambassador will establish his residence in Jerusalem. We can say that uh, the U.S. Consulate, the, the U.S. Consulate in Jerusalem is the only U.S. Consulate in the world that does not send their reports to the U.S. Embassy. The U.S. Consulate in Marseille sends its reports to the U.S. Embassy in Paris, which then sends it on to the State Department in Washington. The U.S. Consulate in Jerusalem acts as a completely independent entity because the United States does not even recognize Jerusalem as part of sovereign Israel never mind not recognizing it as the capital of Israel. Uh, so they send their reports, they send their reports. It's, okay, there are two U.S. consulates. There's one, if you need, let's say, a renewal of your passport, you will go to the American consulate in Arnona. 
and uh, that that consulate just deals with uh, uh, consular services, visas and uh, passports or social security, those kinds of issues. When I go visit uh, consulate officials on political matters, I go to the one on Agro. Okay, that uh, consulate on Agron uh, operates as a uh, de facto embassy to the Palestinian Authority. You go on their website, you will not see anything in Hebrew. We have, what, upwards of 400, 450,000 people living, uh, Jews living in uh, Judea and Samaria. How many of them are Americans? There are some estimates that we have as high as 60,000 Americans living in uh, Judea and Samaria. I think it, it may actually be higher than that. Why don't we have anything in Hebrew on the U.S. Jerusalem Consulate website? Okay, why aren't we allowed to take advantage of cultural opportunities that the uh, consulate is offering to our good neighbors? Okay, uh, so uh, this is a major problem. Uh, what we are trying to do uh, is, let's say, bring this to reality. Uh, and there, there are two different approaches here, and I honor and work with uh, Nadia and uh, the women in green. That's uh, one approach. We are just simply trying to help them. We're trying to support them uh, from, let's say, dealing with some of the fundam fundamentals from the ground up, establishing our superior security claim, establishing our superior uh, religio-historical claim, uh, establishing our superior moral claim, and our job is to establish our superior legal claim based on international law. Uh, so, uh, just quickly, what are we doing? Uh, some of the things, these are just uh, previous uh, members of Knesset that have been uh, supporters of the Legal Grounds, uh, of the legal grounds campaign. Uh, we conduct hearings and forums in the Knesset. We have one-on-one -on -one meetings with members of Knesset. We prepare information packets for them. Uh, we have draft uh, legislation. A wonderful, wonderful Chavrat Knesset, her name is Shuli Mualim, uh, has agreed uh, to introduce legislation, draft legislation that we prepared. She just asked us to hold off because right now she is very, very busy with the Amona situation. Uh, we also draft letters. You'll see some of the letters that we've drafted, uh, and uh, there's a, a particular member of Knesset, his name is Bezalel Smotrich. He has been extremely helpful to us. He has written uh, the letters that we have asked for to members of Congress to break TGLB. Uh, he has uh, written a letter which I shopped around Congress the last time I was there last month. And uh, if some of you followed the Republican National Convention, where their platform committee decided uh, that they were going to take out the language two-state solution from the Israel plank. They should be applauded for that. Uh, they took out that language and then in a subsequent letter, a very, very good sense of Congress letter that was signed by 88 senators, Democrats and Republicans alike, included the language two-state solution in it. Uh, they were telling President Obama not to take any unilateral steps between the time of the election on November 8th and the time of the inauguration on January 20th. Great letter, but why include that language? If it's a plank now in the Republican national platform, then at least the Republican senators, the Republican congressmen should not agree to sign on to any sense of Congress letter, any resolution, any bill that includes that language. Uh, so, Javier uh, Knesset Smotrich helped us with that letter as well. Uh, we uh, have put in Yair Shamir, Minister of Agriculture, former Minister of Agriculture, Yair Shamir, has put in op-eds for us in the newspapers. A member of Knesset who's very helpful to us, Mickey Zohar, has uh, put in uh, op-eds in newspapers. Uh, uh, we are constantly posting on our Facebook page, on our uh, website, israelrights.com. Uh, uh, we advocate also with members of uh, Congress and with members of the European Parliament. 
and we tried to put them together with members of Knesset who are on our side. Some of those members of Knesset who you saw pictures of, that's Robert Dilato. He's also been extremely helpful. Uh, in terms of public relations, we try to provide also non-MK opportunities. So if a Eugene Kantarevich, if a Harel Arnon, who was the brains behind the Levy Report, by the way, he provided most of the material, most of the background material for the uh, Levy Report. Uh, if they need to get out there, if they need to speak, if they uh, need to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, make our talking points for us. We try to provide to, uh, them with those opportunities as well. We're working on a video right now. Arlene Kushner and I got the funding for that. Uh, so we hope to come out with a video shortly. One thing that we started doing, and it turned out to be very, very successful last year, so now we're ex actually expanding the program, is that law students Law students uh, in Tel Aviv University, Barilan University, Hebrew University, the Mechlala, the Law College of Kiryat Ono, uh, get law clinics from organizations like Yesh Din, uh, from Yosmat Geneva. Uh, they uh, get, let's say, the other interpretation of uh, international law. Uh, so what we decided to do was we decided to run a pilot program. Uh, we had an eight session a uh, law clinic uh, last year, we're expanding it to 10 sessions. We had 10 law students, I'm sorry, but we had, yes, 10 law students from uh, the various universities, Hebrew University, Barilan, Tel Aviv University. I'm sorry? Okay, so we had lecturers, let's say, like Harel Arnon, uh, like Eugene Kantorovich, uh, come in and they lectured about about land law based on our interpretation of international law. Okay, because uh, if they're getting it just from one side, they're going to get a very, very stilted view, a very biased view of uh, international law as it applies to land law. By the way, uh, a good friend of mine, Yishai Fleischer, uh, some of you may know him, uh, he lives up on Malay Azetim, has a radio program, he is now the uh, spokesperson for the Jewish community of Hebron. Uh, he came over to me in the Knesset once and he said, why is it uh, that our land law here is a conglomeration of Ottoman law, of British law, of Jordanian law, and of Israeli law? We, he said we can make a case maybe for Ottoman and British, certainly Israeli land law, but why, why Jordanian land law, if it was an illegal occupation, why should their law apply to our situation now. I said, Yishai, that's brilliant. Okay. So I've been shopping this around the Knesset also uh, to try to get any reference to Jordanian land law removed from the corpus of land law that we have here. The other thing that we're going to do this uh, year, we have to hire somebody for this because this is a major project, is we are going to uh, start a program called Lawyers for Legal Grounds. Uh, lawyers seem to be the natural population that we should be uh, attracting for something like this. So lawyers here in Israel, uh, the United States used to have the highest per capita rate of lawyers of any country. Uh, there used to be, in the United States, you have one lawyer for every 221 citizens. It's okay. In, in, in Israel, we shot by them. We now have one lawyer for every 183 citizens. So we have a lot of lawyers here. We have a lot of lawyers over there. Uh, we They are a natural advocacy and support group for us. We're going to try to appeal to them. The other thing that I believe in doing is the only way that I have gotten accomplished in the last nine years as much as I've accomplished is not because I've accomplished it. The only way that I have gotten that done is by working with Nadia and you did working with Women in Green, working with the International Legal Forum. There's a brilliant attorney there. Her name is Yifa Segal. She also came down to Washington with me and lobbied a few weeks ago. Uh, we work with Rega Vim. Rega Vim is an unbelievable organization. I call these organizations the Women in Green, Rega Vim, the International Legal Forum. Uh, for any of you uh, that are in my age demographic, do you know that there was a wonderful children's book uh, called The Little Engine That Could? 
you know, these other left-wing organizations are getting funded to the tune of millions and millions of euros. Here, you have organizations like Women in Green, International Legal Forum, Regavim. Uh, Regavim has a staff of nine, nine attorneys and uh, field representatives. And what they get done uh, with their nine... Uh, there are nine, I, I hesitate to call them employees. Uh, these are dedicated, passionate individuals. Is equal to what these other left-wing organizations get done with staffs of 90. So, yeah, they get, they get paid handsomely. Uh, I'm not talking about Rigovin, by the way, I'm talking about uh, these left-wing organizations. Uh, we also work with the Misrata Chutz. Uh, this uh, young lady over here, Sibi Chotabeli, uh, has been uh, very, very helpful to us. Uh, she has put up on her website, uh, this is, uh, uh, she has put up on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, I'll read this quickly to you, uh, the rights of Jews to establish homes in these areas and the private legal titles to the left, which had been acquired, could not be legally invalidated by Jordanian occupation, which resulted from their illegal armed invasion of Israel in 1948 and was never recognized internationally as legitimate, and such rights and titles remain valid to this day. Okay, so Tzipi Chotabeli has been very good, and uh, I'm just going to tell you what you can do more than anything else is go to our website, israelrights.com, and simply join. It doesn't cost you anything. Nefes, nothing. Uh, there's going to be a pop-up that appears on the landing page at the home page. All it asks you for is your name, your email, are you an Israeli citizen, and uh, then put that in. Why? Because when I go to the Knesset, if I can speak on, in the name of, on behalf of thousands of you, believe you me, you take something like Mate Lugumi, when they come to the Knesset with a block of potential voters, Members of Knesset sit up and listen. You take a look at the difference in the votes. A few dozen votes between Sipi Chotabeli's uh, place number 20 on the Likud list and Avi Dichter, uh, who was in an unrealistic 27, just a few dozen votes separated them. So any of these members of Knesset know that these blocks of votes could spell the difference between them getting a realistic place on the Bayit Yehudi or Likud list as opposed to an unrealistic place. Israelrights.com. Yeah, Israelrights.com. Thank you. And here I just want to finish with this one slide. For those of you uh, uh, who do not understand the Hebrew, I'll just tell you very, very briefly what this is about. The organization that I work with, Regavim, conducted a poll in October of 2013. It was conducted by Gal HaChadash, uh, the uh, new wave. And uh, they asked a very, very simple question. They asked in this poll, are you for or against the settlement enterprise? Uh, do you believe that the quote-unquote settlers should be uh, withdrawn? Approximately one-third, approximately one-third of the number uh, said that they do not believe in the settlement enterprise and uh, the settlers should be withdrawn from the settlements. Okay, they took that subgroup and they asked them an additional question. They asked that subgroup, that one-third, well, if based on international law, the settlers have a right to live and build in these territories, would you still be in favor of withdrawing them? One third of that one third believe that they should still be withdrawn. So there is plenty of room here within the public domain, within greater Israel to change public opinion. Uh, I think that this is a, a very, very, very important here. I don't even know if uh, the slide was up. Here's, here's the slide. Uh, so I think, I think that this really uh, is the raison d'etre for legal grounds. This is why we are doing what we are doing uh, to change and hopefully convince even that one-third of one-third that we have a right and a duty uh, to be where we are today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Nadia.
Thank you so, so much.